The following program contains scenes that some viewers may find upsetting. We advise viewer discretion. I'm Neil Bucker. Welcome to Inside New Zealand. To some, they're superheroes. To others, big kids who never grew up. They're the firefighters, professionals who protect us and our property from all kinds of danger. Tonight, we invite you to don the uniform of a professional firefighter and for the next hour, experience the dangers and difficulties, both in the job and at home, that firefighters face every day of their working life. <laughs> I was brought up in the fire service. My father was a station officer. I liked the sort of job he was doing and I thought the challenge was there for me. I enjoy the job, job satisfaction, uh, helping people, people who are in need of help by a fire, motor accident or something like that. You can help the situation. I became a fireman because um, it appealed to me, it appealed to me ever since I was a little boy and uh, I started and I'm still here. There's eight of us on the Blue Watch at Porra Fire Station. We work shifts along with three other teams, and when we're on duty, the eight of us are responsible for over 46,000 people. Did we the water here? Oh, yeah, shit. Have a good four days off? Yeah. yeah. A fire station's like a ship that doesn't go to sea. When you come to a fire station, you're on board. So f for 10 hours of the day, you're locked in with the guys that you came to work with. We are here, and we're here for the duration, that's it. Firemen range in age from about 18 to 60, and we're mostly married men with kids. There's no bronze Dan's ex. There probably are a few, <laughs> they're on the calendars. But no, we come in all shapes and sizes, from all different backgrounds. Probably that diversity makes us good team. Blue Watch is one of the four crews that man the station 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Because there's only eight of us, it's important that we get on. We have to do everything ourselves, from cooking and cleaning one moment to putting out fires the next. Blue Watch is on this station is a good, good watch. We all get on really well. We've most of us been here together for quite a long time in service, and I think we rely on each other a lot. There's no pattern. You can go days where you have one or two calls. You can go days where you'll have five or six calls. There's, there's no pattern to it at all. <laughs> Dave probably needs to wait. Look at that one. Wait. What's going on here? Oh, you didn't? You had a small one. That was Donald, must have grabbed it. I brought a big cup in. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Tasting. Tea blue. No, I don't matter. I'll have a little one. Just sides, mate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's good to get in and actually do the do the job you're trained for, I suppose. But unfortunately, it means someone else's uh, house is burning down or crashed their car or, or something like that. Young firefighter was um, somebody used to probably lean on the front doors at Central Fire Station and wish that the whole city would burn down so he could go out there and do his thing, you know. As you grow older, you realise that you've got a sense of your own mortality in other people's too. You know, and you see lots of things, 
people get hurt. Um, that's no, that's not so funny. So yeah, you don't wish for wish for that anymore. The Pyra Fire Station covers an area of approximately 200 square kilometres. We have over 800 calls a year. What's on fire? Um, I don't know. I can't see. It's the back of the house. When the alarms go, your adrenaline starts. You have to keep control of your mind and body, otherwise you make mistakes. You've got to keep calm and focused on the job in hand. My main role probably is to get them to the fire safely and make sure that I can keep their water supplies up. Each house fire you go to can be different. People have chemicals in houses, stored in houses, pesticides and all that type of thing. You don't really know what's at the other end. And it can be nothing. And your expectations of something, of going to action are up. Everything's working, you know, everybody's ready to go. So if it is going, that yahoo quickly turns to, hey, let's do the job. When we pull up, there's a lot of things to think about. Is there a fire? Where is it? How bad? Is anybody inside? Are things going to get worse? Yeah, yeah, smoke down there. Oh, right. Yeah, go around the back and see if Nothing there. Nothing that goes to a basement under here. Fine, okay. Okay, so there could be something right. underneath and this part just, here. Just as a little precaution, I want the ceiling checked out. Okay. Seeing as nobody here, you never know. Okay, okay. just check out the ceiling and that'll do it. And a fire, Ian's in charge, anyway. We all know that. He's been in the job long enough to respect his decisions and, and you know, you know that. He's not going to put him into a, a situation where he wouldn't go himself. So I trust him. Morning, Dave. Yeah, nobody's been up there, have they? Uh, the carpet layer arrived here to do a quote for carpet for the housing corporation, and they'd smelt burning in them. So obviously, kids have been in through, they've broken into the house and actually um, set fire to some paper and then disappeared. We were let down at this time, there was nothing. I don't want anyone to have to, to drag me around and do things like that. So I keep my fitness up to keep up with the younger guys. I was a university blue at rowing and drinking and telling dirty jokes. And telling dirty jokes. That's exciting, let's face it. Jumping out of aeroplanes is exciting to some people, not to me. But I still find firefighting. Uh, Stimulating. Okay, one claw hammer. Yep. One club hammer. Yep. One cold chisel. Yep. One bracing bit. Yep. One hand saw. Yep. Hack saw. Yep. Large screwdriver. Yep. 
All the gear we carry and the appliances get checked at least twice a day. Our lives and the lives of other people depend on the gear working the first time up. For a while, a lot of people sort of think it's like Code Red on TV where we sit around all day just waiting, playing cards, drinking tea or coffee, waiting for a fire call. Actually, you still get that sometimes. Oh, I suppose we've interrupted your game of pool. Just let it walk. It's water off a of quackers. You know, I mean, my guys work hard here. Um, this is a small station, small suburban station, servicing quite a large area. Um, and my guys, well, all the crews here work very hard. Not just firefighting. They work hard in their day-to-day -day routines. There's a lot of things to do. Breathing apparatus is like an aqua lung to a diver. You can't survive underwater without an aqua lung, and you can't survive on a fire without a breathing apparatus set. Quite a terrifying experience, you know, knowing that you can't take your mask off you, and if you're working really hard and you're breathing and that kind of thing, and there's, you know, there's no air there. Firefighters have to be fit, so we train in the heat chamber. It's designed to reproduce conditions that we face in a real fire. It's dark, humid, heated to about 70 degrees, and it's filled with catwalks, pipes, and restrictive areas that we work through. To stay a firefighter, you have to be able to get around this course within a certain time and before your air runs out. still on top, the gas will see. We train for all sorts of possible emergencies, including chemical spills and gas leaks. Natural gas flames burn at around about sort of 800 degrees C. Sometimes even training can be dangerous. The whole idea is to, to force the, the flame away from the valve grouping uh, so you can actually close the valve down. To me it's like a, a soldier going to war. You don't go to war and not expect to be shot. So in our job, there's every chance that you might possibly get burned. The rugby team can, can pack down a scrum and lose, lose the tight head, right? But we can't afford to lose the tight head. We've got to make sure we get it. We, we've got to make sure that we get the, get the ball back. We've got to be there, and it, it is teamwork. And, and you look around and you see the guys that are there with you and you think, it's OK, I feel good about this, it's no problem. You know, if you get in trouble, that you can trust that the guys you're working with will come and help you out. And that's a big thing, I think. If there's any break in the spray pattern, uh, the flame can come back through. Although uh, Butts got burnt, he still stayed for as long as he could. His gut feeling was, oh, I'd like to get out of here, but 
he couldn't get out or he didn't want to go out because he had the rest of the team that he would let down. So he stayed in there, received the burns and um, carried on. Yeah, we saw it coming around that side. Yeah. Sweepers? Yeah, we were there. Yeah. Just wasn't doing it. Just coming twice. I had yeah. butter all here to start with. The actual story, it's actually deeper than normal for some reason. What happens is the good idea. See delivery going on. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. And that's what I'm losing you. I want to go forward, you don't want to step down. Right? Or at that stage. So you must well, I can't trust, know you you must you trust me and look to see where your footing is. Yeah. Right? I don't know whether you want to go down that stage. I things going like this. Yeah. That stage. And uh, it must have been Butts was getting a twinge and he was going, and I was thinking, shit, I better back here. I could feel the heat. And it must have been coming around. Well, I've obviously got a bit. Yeah. I, I, I got around from you on right. that side. Okay, look. So go. When you step down, come you down know, and with what's you. What's actually happened is the scoria has gone out of the bed. We're in a different yeah. scenario, which, yeah. I mean, you can't help that. That's just the way the conditions are, so we've yeah. got to do that. But um, I don't want to bloody have a repeat of that. That's not funny. All right, that's getting dangerous. It's stupid. Yeah, Most automatic fire alarms turn out to be nothing, but they can surprise you. Sometimes the public probably think we're overreacting, but uh, experienced firefighters know that they have to take every call seriously. Turn the alarm off, would you believe? We can't get in to the stinking door. Mm. Just hold that, mate. You've done that before. Oh, yeah. Because the key you don't, don't fit. Don't fit. Don't fit. Mm. Okay. Don't get this door off soon, guys. There's going to be a riot outside. <laughs> Fire Brigade has a family. There is, there's two families, the one that you have at home, and that's your, your wife, your kids, the people that you know, and then there's, the, then there's this lot, and God help us all. But uh, no, yeah, they are, they're, they're, they're t there's definitely two separations, and I try now not to let one overlap into the other. Perhaps I think it's short hand to say Grace. Grace. All right, let's get into it. Uh, it was our son actually said to us, Dad's got two lives. He's got a life at home and he's got a life at the fire station. And it's like having two families. Um, you have your family life at home, you do your things at home. And with the guys, when you're on duty, you work together, you sleep in the same building together, 
uh, you cook together, you yeah. joke together, you, you play together, you do, do, you do everything together there. Don't worry. Bring home. Burning wood. You mean once you should be inside by uh, watching television oh, this time? The house, eh? the house is locked. Yeah. Oh, you've been locked out? Yeah. Oh, right. Mate, so you just wait. How long are we going to have to wait? I oh, know. <laughs> Terrible work. Yeah. Well, don't. I'll tell you what, mate, you can't do that, eh? Oh, yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, fair enough? Yeah. All right. You got some water to put it out with? Yeah. Thank you. Much obliged. Everyone off to the barbecue on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's all wood there. Where do you live, mate? I'll show you. Yeah, you can you come in in my you? place. Oh. That's where the smoke coming through. Oh. When they ring up, their expectations are that somebody will come and fix it. As far as the fire service is concerned, right throughout the world, that can mean anything from going to look at somebody's carpet because they've had fleas after they've come back from holiday to changing the light bulb. Um, like the, some of the things are so bizarre you wouldn't believe them probably, but if we can help them, we can. How old is the set, man? About 12 years. Oh, it should, it's got plenty of going yet. It should be all right, shouldn't it? We got a call to an old lady whose TV set had started smoking. And how long have you been an expert on electronics? Not actually an expert. You're not actually an expert, but you, but you know quite a bit about television sets, obviously. You watch television, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, well, obviously you know quite a lot about it. These are these grandmas. Hey? Richard Clayman. Do you, do you know who he is? You've never seen him before. Uh, but before my time. You take, the, you take the good ones with the bad ones. And that's, that's just one of the ones where you just have to go and check it out and um, nothing there. Method of alarm, triple one. Zone code, three one zero zero five. Three five zero zero. The paperwork's a bit of a pain in the butt. Once we get back from a call, the times and particulars of each call have to be taken down from the control room. All the details are put into the fire report and sent to headquarters. Okay, let's keep it quiet. <laughs> get away. 
They all need the beauty sleep out here. <laughs> See you later, mate. See ya. Fire station. Yeah, hi, how's it going? I'm just going to grab a seat on the floor. Oh, what you been doing? Reading. Reading. Yeah, I think about my, my own family all the time. Yeah, uh, my wife works, so especially on night shifts and that type of thing, we meet in passing. I say goodbye as she walks in the door type of thing. No, it's not, Scott not rung at all or anything like that? Ah. I don't like shift work. I have 18 years of um, being ruled by the fire brigade calendar. I don't like, you know, we're not part of that. That's, that's his life. Um, and then he has our life as well. It's like living two different lives. No, I, I quite look forward to the nights when he's away. I take a good book to bed and um, don't have to worry about turning the light out, you know. Bag of lollies in my bedside and my book and I'm quite happy. Uh, it annoys me, yeah, because of the um, way it does affect family life. People aren't aware of how the shifts, it sounds so good that they have these four days off and things, but just the shifts, how much your, your life has to be revolved around them. More worried about being on your own than about him being, going to fires here. Yeah. No, I don't like nights on my own. See you in the morning, Dave. See you in the morning, He has a bedroom there that he's slept in for 18 years that I have nothing to do with. You know, that's just not part of my life. Some of what you see and have to do as a firefighter can affect you emotionally. I went to a call where the person inside was still alive in a house fire. And um, was burnt to death. When you see it, it's something that will, you know, that will never leave your memory. And it's you know, once you've seen it, that's it, really. At night time, when you close your eyes, you could, you know, get flashes of what had what had happened, that kind of thing. I had a few sleepless nights, and you probably did too. You used to mm, wake nice. her up and have a chat. Just with time. It went by, I actually took my daughter down to Dunedin, down to my parents' place. Stayed at my mum's house and, and used the excuse that Lana didn't like the, the darkness, so we slept with the light on for a, a few nights and it kind of came up. Just over time, it just kind of faded away. Our families don't have to experience the stress and the trauma that sometimes we have to on the job. But I suppose that they're affected you know, just because we are, you know, we try not to take it home, but sometimes it's pretty hard to avoid. If I wanted to know, then I perhaps would have become a firefighter myself. I don't want to know every little detail. I always ask how his day went and if anything happened, but yeah, as for actual detail, he doesn't go into it too much. I was coming uh, home off duty and got caught up in traffic along here. Uh, well, obviously a motor accident up ahead, but it stopped. The car heading south um, stopped. He saw, saw my uniform, told me there'd been an accident up ahead. I came through to where the cars were at the scene here. There was one car 
over here where the driver had been thrown onto the road. There was another car hard up against the bank over there. The driver was well and truly trapped, so nothing could be done for him until the emergency services arrived, and a little girl on the road as well. Um, we started to work on the little girl and gave her mouth to mouth. Worked on her for about 15 minutes, and then they said that nothing, could be, nothing more could be done for the child. So we picked the child up and then took her into the back of an ambulance. That's the hard part because um, you know, I've got, I had two granddaughters at, the same, at that time with the same age, uh, three years old, and to pick that child up and take her into the ambulance and it's sort of, you start thinking of your own family or your own children, grandchildren, etc. And once again, after I left the scene or the area here and drove home, driving on home, you think about your own grandchildren and, and the age that they're at and that child's life had finished at that age. One of the things this station gets called to do a lot of is cutting people out of cars. If we're called out, it usually means somebody's seriously hurt. The one of the worst jobs I probably have attended was a a car accident at north of Pukaroo Bay, where a stock transport brought a sheep truck ran off the back of a car, and there was two kids in the back of that car, and they were actually burnt to death. Um, that was quite a bad accident, that one. Burnt bodies, kids' bodies. That's that's probably the hardest thing, you know, children and you know, motor accidents or anything like that. That sort of thing can stick in your mind for a while. Probably the biggest stress that I find is um, mainly where kids are involved and mainly because they don't put themselves in a lot of situations they find themselves in. It's normally through, you know, maybe an adult's mistake that they're in that situation. Usually if we have anything like that, we'll come back and sit down and have a talk. You know, just have a talk about it around, you know, have a cup of tea and and probably that's where it's left. I mean, you don't go home and talk about it. Things like that in front of your family. Once you've talked about it, you just can't dwell on something and, and, and think about it because otherwise that affects the way, it can affect your life. Because of what I've seen in my job, I've tended to lecture my kids more than the average father. Why not? Pay for it. Carl bought him a card for his birthday. I say, I'd like to repay you everything you've given me, but I can't remember that many lectures um, because that's what it is. Got a warrant and registration, everything or not? Yep. There's top and bonnet. I'll have a look in the bonnet. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, with three teenage boys with cars. Um, there's possibly a, a great, you know, at some time, have them been involved in an accident, or maybe I might be there or I might be, I don't know. What's the tyres I've got, son? Oh, not bad. Not bad? Yeah. How about the rust in the chassis? No, rust in the chassis? No, it's not, not too bad. Not too bad? No. What about the panel work here? We went to the pictures one night and we're coming out the car parking building and a young guy reversed straight out into Wayne's brand new van. No marks or anything, but they drove back and Wayne got out and raced over and they'd been drinking. So he ordered a carload of boys out of the car and out of the car parking building, gave them a lecture on drink, not, on drink driving, and they 
very quietly got out the car and left the car parking building. Then I told the attendant on the way, I said, you know, this is the number of the car. If they come down, they try to get out, don't let them out. They enjoy helping people, but that, of course, kind of affects them. Seeing people suffering must affect people. You never really get used to waking up to the, the bright lights and the alarms blaring at you. One minute you're fast asleep, next minute you're screaming down the road to God knows what. If you thought about it, you probably wouldn't sleep at all. Most of the fires we deal with are fairly small and straightforward, but then maybe once or twice a year we get called to a really big one. Yeah, if you haven't had anything for a while, sometimes you get a Yahoo, but that quickly changes to maybe uh oh. And so you can't just suddenly think, oh yeah, yippee, this is a big fire, or whatever, because there's, you know, people, maybe persons reported there's people in the place, and you've got to organise to keep people safe. Make sure our guys don't get hurt. Make sure anything doesn't get any worse. You work on adrenaline, and the danger part of it goes goes out the door. You, you don't think of danger. You're aware of the surroundings around you and what's happening around you. It's easy to get caught in a difficult situation, as I did in a school fire a couple of years ago. We got into the gymnasium and. Uh, it was, it was weightlifting gear over the place. We laid our hoses out and they were all snaked all over the floor. I said to the guys, you guys carry on into the smoke-filled corridor and I'll just like, feed the hose into you. They had breathing apparatus on. But because I'd run down the outside of the building when I first arrived there, I hadn't, they hadn't put anything on at that stage, which is a no-no, of course. And by the time I'd fed the hose into the corridor, the smoke had come down right there. And I thought, fine, that's OK, I'm not too worried about it, being in this situation before. Except when I came to find the door again, the double doors that went out into the clean, area, clean corridor, I couldn't find them. And no. where I thought the doors were, there was blocked walls. I was getting a bit panicky, I was getting worried then, because the smoke was down, I didn't have any breathing going on. And by that stage, I'm starting to cough and splutter, and there's no way I can see anything. My divisional officer actually arrived in the corridor and I could hear him yell out, Who the bloody hell's... Well, he didn't say bloody, he said something else actually. But he said, Who the... That. And I thought, Good, I can hear somebody. And I fell out through these double doors like somebody getting kicked out of a bar. And uh, he said, Oh, it's you. And I went straight back to the pump, got my BA set. I thought, Bloody hell. Every firefighter that's ever been to fires will tell you about different things where you know, being somewhere and the roof started to slip down the walls or falling downstairs. And that's when guys think, oh, I'm out of here. I've heard of stories when young firemen wanted to panic and the older ones would actually sit on them because they knew they weren't in any danger. They'd actually sit on them. Fires are dangerous and we have to work together to make sure none of us is hurt or killed. In the fire service, you're trained to do a job and we work as a team. 
So therefore, to me, if you don't work as a team and work as a hero, you're letting the team down. We thank you for his friendship and the family. Thank you for a brother. Henry Brown was a volunteer firefighter for 12 years. Give he died of cancer and, and we all went to his funeral. To the life and for the life of Henry Albert Brown. Whether or not they were killed on duty, many firemen have their funerals at a fire station. Family, uh, to officiate for you, my name is... If someone dies in the Navy and it's their wish to be buried to sea, I find it quite natural actually, perhaps because of the fire service or the fire station, it's a bit like a second home and, and quite, often, if, quite often if you die, you, you know, your body gets taken home for a while anyway. I, we, deeply mourn his loss. He will always be fondly remembered by the fire service family. I've heard this term used over the years and, and I used to think, what's this? It sounds like a load of rubbish, a family, it's not, what's a family? But it is a family and the family fights, it squabbles, but we always make friends again. That's what families are. I'd, I'd be quite proud of Nathan coming along and said, I want to be a fireman and go through it. Um, looking back to myself, I was in the same position. You know, I followed my father through. Um, and I think it'd be, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd like it, yeah. Overall, we're a pretty close knit group of people basically because um, we do this job and it's, it's not really like any other. When the time's up for me to go, I'm, I'm pretty sure, as I say, I'll accept that. It would have to be because I couldn't do the job. You know, I, was, I got too old and, and couldn't do it physically. I think there'd be withdrawal symptoms. Um, you know, if you've done something for so long, and it, it is more than a job, so, and then coming back to live in one world instead of in two, I, I think that um, it'll take a bit of adjusting. it to anything else. I have, I've always been a fireman's wife. I couldn't imagine him not being a firefighter. I mean, he's just always been one. It's just our life. the unsung heroes of today's society. Next week, we revisit the graduates of the Limited Service Volunteer Company to find out what's become of them 12 months after they survived the New Zealand Army's six-week life skills course at Burnham Military Camp. Really sucks being on the dole. Earlier this year, Inside New Zealand followed a group of unemployed people through a training program with the Army. The documentary was called Get a Job. Next Wednesday, we learn how they're doing now. We just got to work really hard to get there. And we see how, for some, life is very different. It was opening up for me. The banks are looking at me now because I've got a job. Get a job, part three on Inside New Zealand next week. Join us again then. Have a good week. I'm Neil Wacker. Bye for now.
This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee, so you could see more of New Zealand on air.